Welcome to Cardiology, Cardiovascular Division Grand Rounds. It's a pleasure to be introducing Rachel Marcus to you, and I thank Umberto for pointing out my deficiency for over 20 years and not bringing her here. Uh, Rachel is a Marshall Wolf trained internist, did her medical internship residency, and then for some reason decided to go to Stanford. Uh, and do her cardiology fellowship and stayed on there for a little bit. And then to the Washington Hospital uh, to run, to be part of their core, core echo group. And then to uh, be the medical director of L-A-S-O-C-H-A. And that's why I'm here. I'm up here to tell you what that means. <laughs> and I will do that in a moment. It's the Latin American Society of Chagas. So, uh, uh, so welcome back, and uh, you've already gotten a nice welcome from our fellows and uh, and the people who knew you from the good old days. And uh, I've heard that this is a topic we need to hear more about. Doctor Stone liked the topic that we had listed. It was called looking for zebras, or something? yeah, we had the. Uh, uh, Chagas disease in the United States, it's not the zebra you might think. So we kind of like that. Uh, so, but thank you very much, Rachel, and we look forward to telling us about zebras. So it's an incredible honor for me to be here back at the Brigham. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we also have some people in the audience who I imagine actually know more than I do about Chagas disease. I gather there are some uh, Brazilian cardiologists who are here. And we also have Jen Manny and Julia Kohler who have been doing Chagas disease or research in Boston. So if you have any future questions, they can be directed that way. So my talk is Chagas cardiomyopathy in the United States. It should have been the zebra one. I'm sorry, uh, what you need to know. Um, my perspective on Chagas disease is very much colored by the work that I do with Latin American immigrants in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area uh, who are, in general, undocumented, trying to stay below the radar um, screen, uh, uninsured, and very poor. And so that colors a lot of the perspective that I bring to Chagas disease, which is different in some other areas in the country where the process of working with Latin American immigrants actually is easier because of more beneficial health care programs. So with that to start, I'm just going to speak about one non-FDA approved medication today, nifurtimox. And my goals for today are to reacquaint you with this fascinating disease and to convince you that you will see it if you look for it. And I'll try to describe for you who you should screen and update you about current recommendations for therapy. I put this map up here because it, it's kind of a good way of showing where people used to think that Chagas disease was, these countries in red where Chagas disease are endemic. Uh, this is every non-island Latin American country. But now with massive population shifts out of Latin America to other areas of the world, you can find patients with Chagas disease in all of the colored areas on this map, which includes still Latin American countries, the green countries where Chagas disease really only is brought by people who got the diseases in Latin America, so immigration-associated disease, including Canada, Western Europe, and Australia, and Japan. And then the area in blue is a place where there's Chagas disease that is found in immigrants, but also we have the potential to have autochthonous or domestically derived disease because we have both the vector and the parasite in the southern half of the United States. Most of my discussion today will be related to the immigrant uh, patients, though. So what did we learn about in medical school about Chagas disease? It's been a long time for me. Uh, Chagas disease is a parasitic infection that causes long-term heart and gastrointestinal damage. It's chiefly transmitted by rejuvid bugs to a mammalian host, and there are over 100 reservoirs known. The reason why that's important is because to have a goal of eradicating Chagas disease is not practical because the bug exists in, the, in wildlife and, and other animals can have it too, so there really would be no way to, to completely eradicate the disease. Uh, it's traditionally thought of as a disease of rural poverty in which a domiciled nocturnal bug feeds on sleeping victims. It lives in cracks and crevices of poorly built houses and chicken coops. I have to stop to give a shout out to Carlos Chagas. This man was a rock star. He completely described the vector, the parasite, the disease course, and proved Cox postulates on his own from 1907 to 1912, which is why that many in Brazil feel that he was unjustly deprived of a Nobel Prize in medicine, and I think that's probably actually accurate. So we can talk about him more if people are interested afterwards. 
These are some examples of the kind of rural housing that's associated with risk of having Chagas disease. You can see that these are very poorly plastered homes, that they often don't have walls. Domestic animals can walk in and out, and as we know, these animals can also have Chagas disease. Uh, palm frond roofs, and just another example here of the sort of poorly plastered walls. And this is a piece of plaster that's been pulled off of the wall, and you can see that these are two of the triatomine insects that you could find nestled there. The other thing that's important, actually, is that some of these black stripes may be fecal material, which is actually the way that the disease is transmitted. So in addition to being next to the bug, people are also exposed to parasite from the feces that are on the walls. The bug that transmits this disease it has a variety of different names. It actually depends on what country uh, you're, you're dealing with, what the name of the bug is. It in, they include kissing bug in the United States, insecto asesino, vinchuca, chinche, barbeiro, chipo, and pito. And they're all triatomine insects, and you can see that they're a variety of different kinds. And again, just to reiterate, we do have them up to the, the, basically the top of the lower half of the United States, all the way down to this part of, of South America. So this is what happens. This is a bug that's actually having a blood meal. It has this very long proboscis. While it's eating, it actually has a very fast gastrocolic reflex. And so this is actually fecal matter that's come out of this bug. There's parasite in the feces. And what happens usually is that somebody will either rub this or scratch it into the bite wound or will actually rub it into their uh, uh, conjunctiva. And that's the way that the parasite actually enters the human host. This is a pretty big bug. I mean, there are nymph stages that are smaller than this, but in general, it's so big that if it landed on you, you would brush it off pretty quickly because it's not, it's not like a tiny little bug. So it's why it tends to land on sleeping, or to actually crawl on to sleeping children, and, and it's thought to be a disease that tends to be contracted in childhood while people are asleep and then on exposed skin, so that tends to be the face or the arms. This is what the parasite looks like. Chagas named, named it after his uh, mentor, Oswaldo Cruz. There are at least six different strains. They're broadly grouped into T. cruzi 1 and T. cruzi 2, and there are several substrains within each of those. So we've talked about this as being a disease of rural poverty in Latin America, but there's some newer thoughts about transmission that I think are really important to go into. First, it's actually worth acknowledging that several of the countries in Latin America understood what the cycle of this disease was, and they realized that if they could improve the quality of rural housing, that would go a long way to keeping people from being exposed to the biting insect and getting the disease. So there have been massive spraying campaigns and improvement of substandard housing in rural Latin America that have allowed several of the countries to actually certify that they no longer have the domestic vector. It's hard to get rid of the, the kinds of bugs that live in the forests because they just can't do the requisite kind of screening there, uh, spraying there. But some countries have virtually eradicated new cases that are acquired by vector-mediated disease. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked perfectly everywhere. It, a good example might be Bolivia, where a president like Evo Morales decides that he hates the entire eastern half of the country, and so there are no, screening, there are no spraying programs in a lot of the rural villages. And you could speak more to that, Dr. Martin, I'm sure. Other countries like El Salvador, where there were routine screening programs, and now there's so much gang warfare that it's actually not safe to go out into the communities to be able to continue to screen, regardless. So another really important thing for our purposes is vertical transmission. About 5% of infected mothers will pass uh, the baby to their infant. Uh, it can be transmitted via blood transfusion, and it can actually also be transmitted via organ donors. So that's really important to remember. The good news about blood transfusion is that now um, probably 95% of first-time blood donors in the United States are screened for Chagas disease, regardless of their country of origin or travel history. So in general, we have programs in place that have significantly reduced the risk of, of, blood, of transfusion-associated disease. Unfortunately, um, donor organ disease continues to be a problem because not every UNOS network in the United States routinely screens their Latin American donor pool for Chagas disease. Reactivation disease is another way that you can actually see a, a, an acute disease in which someone who's chemically or disease-induced immunosuppressed, especially HIV with CD4 counts less than 200, can develop acute disease. There is oral disease. It's probably not going to be much of a problem for us in the U.S., but in the north of, of Latin America or the north of South America, um, there are people who drink acai juice or sugarcane juice that has not been pasteurized, and there's a very, very high parasite burden, and it causes a very fulminant acute disease. Regardless, if you have Chagas disease, you are likely somebody who is poor, and that's really important as we've already talked about. 
So this is what it looks like. These are a, a cluster of, of amastigotes in the myocardium. And parenthetically, this is what it might look like in smooth muscle cells that are lining the esophagus and the, and the colon as well. But we're going to focus on cardiac disease today. Um, in terms of the pathophysiology of the disease, it used to be that people thought that because of the paucity of circulating organisms, that this is probably mostly an autoimmune phenomenon. But there are circulating parasites, and the PCR really shows that there's persistence of paras in parasites in the human host in almost anybody who gets infected. So it's, in, and you can actually see these uh, air, parasite DNA in areas of lymphocytic infiltrate. So this, the reason why I bolded this is because fundamentally Chagas disease is a lymphocytic myocarditis. Um, there also are microvascular abnormalities with intimal proliferation and arteritis, abnormal vasodilatation leading to watershed ischemia. Um, there's tropism of the parasite for autonomic nerve termini, so there could be profound autonom autonomic derangements. And then there probably is also, or there certainly is also, a new mediated injury, which leads altogether to myocardial damage and fibrosis. To very briefly mention cytokines, I just wanted to mention that the interferon gamma access is, is, is part of the disease. I don't want to spend much more time on that. So in terms of the gross pathology and some of the histopathology, which really I think will inform our discussion about the clinical manifestations of the disease, these are four hearts with Chagas disease. This one A is a dilated left ventricle with scarring at the apex and thrombosis at the apex. These are patients who can develop congestive heart failure and stroke. This is a more hypertrophied ventricle with very focal scarring at the apex. This is probably part of the path pathognomonic lesion for Chagas disease known as the apical aneurysm or punch hole lesion uh, that can be very, very focal and unfortunately cause catastrophic medical complications. This is a basal inferolateral wall, which is thinned and scarred. It's highly arrhythmogenic. A lot of the patients who have sudden death from VT will have it because of this lesion. And this is the his Purkinje system showing intense fibrosis. These are patients who have significant, significant Brady arrhythmia north of, of Latin America or the north or from the scar. So there are three so phases that have been the pasteurized, and there's which we're unlikely to see vector-mediated uh, 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 acute disease in the United States. It tends to be fairly nonspecific, which is really going to complicate our ability to make the diagnosis, even if we did see it, because we're probably not going to think about it. Lasts for about six to eight weeks. This you might remember from medical school. It's called Romagna sign. This is a girl who probably got infected fecal material in her eye. She has painless swelling of her eyelid, which can last for several weeks. It's thought to be pathognomonic of Chagas, but it turns out um, that the, both the bite and the feces can be intensely irritating, so people can get this kind of a reaction even if there's not parasite present. Um, a small number of people can actually get very, very ill from acute disease, including myocarditis, meningoencephalitis, and about 10% of those can be fatal. Parasitemia is ubiquitously present in these patients, and treatment with antiparasitic medications can be curative. So it's great to find it if we can think of it. That this is probably other acute presentations awesome. that we might be more likely to see in the United States, including congenital Chagas. And when a patients are gen the babies are generally born asymptomatic, but they can be premature with hepatosplenomegaly, anemia, and high drops. Just one thing about this, and you can actually see these to diagnose it because maternal A and areas of acidic actions. There's reactivation disease, uh, the either disease-induced HIV, which tends to present with neurologic manifestations that look a lot like toxoplasmosis. So if you have a Latin American immigrant who looks like they have toxo, it could be Chagas, and it won't respond well to, to toxotherapy. There's also medication-induced, in, i.e. transplant immunosuppression. Patients will get an odd lesion, sort of a paniculitis, that is actually teeming with trypanosomes, and it's a pretty unusual uh, complication of reactions. So, and then also the cardiac, um, cardiac manifestations, you can't actually get uh, a myocarditis from it. We've talked about oral, and we've talked about transfusion and donor organ, so I'll move along. So virtually everyone, if they're untreated in the acute phase, goes into the indeterminate phase of disease. Uh, in which they really have no end organ manifestations except for maybe some autonomic dysfunction. It's defined as positive serology, and it needs to be of two forms. And in the United States, what that means is that you have to basically do your commercial lab analysis first, and then you need to send a blood sample to the CDC if your commercial analysis comes back positive. So this guy here, it's just kind of cute. He's having something called xenodiagnosis. Unfortunately, we can't order this in the States. There are laboratory-bred triatamines that are sitting in those cups, and they're eating, uh, eat, basically having a blood meal. And then they go back to the lab, and they stay in the lab, and they eat chicken blood because chickens don't get Chagas. And then at some point, they're harvested, and people look into the intestines and see if there are trypanosomes there. So there shouldn't be trypanosomes in them from anywhere else. If trypanosomes are in their intestines, it came from this patient right here. 
Interestingly enough, my patients who've had this done have told me that it hasn't bothered them. I think there must be enough anesthetic in the proboscis that it's not, I mean, he looks pretty unfazed. Uh, but again, not something that LabCorp or Quest uh, will do. So uh, the important thing about this is that this is the end of significant manifestations of disease for most of the people who have Chagas disease. Somewhere around 70 to 80% of patients will not progress, including the index patient who Chagas first actually published as a patient with Chagas disease, died from something else at an advanced age. But about 2 to 5% per year will progress. And this number actually comes in part from Jamie McGuire's work doing a longitudinal EKG follow-up study in Brazil uh, when he was getting his PhD, I think. So thank you for that, Jamie. Sorry you can't be here. Um, what is the chronic phase of Chagas disease? So it generally presents about 15 to 30 years after the time of likely infection. So if these people are being infected as children, they're then getting d uh, disease manifestations in their 30s and 40s and 50s, which as you imagine, if you are a day laborer and all of a sudden you can't work anymore, can be financially and medically catastrophic. <laughs> Um, it's really, unfortunately, not clear who. This is one of the holy grails of Chagas research right now, is to try to figure out who is actually going to develop long-term cardiac damage. People wonder whether or not it's the degree of parasitemia, whether or not it's the number of times they got reinfected, whether or not these are actually men. Men tend to have worse disease. Maybe they're men doing manual labor when they have this myocarditis, which we generally wouldn't recommend. Strain type, genetic factors in the immune response, I don't think anybody can say they really know yet which of the patients are going to progress. Um, I'm not really going to talk much about gastrointestinal manifestations, but they happen less commonly, and it seems like they happen more frequently in, Latin, in, in South American countries. So what are the symptoms of the chronic phase of Chagas disease? So people can get angina-like chest pain from microvascular disease. They can get exertional intolerance, either from heart failure or from chronotropic incompetence. Palpitations and syncope, either from autonomic issues, profound bradyarrhythmias, tachyarrhythmias, heart failure, and stroke. And this um, is, pr is probably due to a, a combination of both the presence of the apical aneurysm, higher rates of atrial fibrillation, and potentially to a prothrombotic state that Chagas patients has. Nobody really knows for sure. The cause of death is thought to be 50% sudden cardiac death, 40% heart failure, and 10% embolic event. Um, I put up this slightly too busy slide just to say that patients with Chagas disease tend to have really less comorbid disease than patients with other uh, heart failures. And this is actually comes from uh, Dr. Solomon's work uh, from the paradigm heart failure and, um, uh, and uh, atmosphere combined analyses uh, com that compared all the Latin American patients who had either Chagas disease, other non-ischemic cardiomyopathies or ischemic cardiomyopathies, and you can see that there are a lot of statistically significant differences between the Chagas patients and the other ones. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So if your patient was confirmed positive for Chagas disease, what do you do now? The first test that you would do, aside, of course, from an excellent physical exam and history would be an EKG with a 30-second rhythm strip. And that's because it's the main diagnostic criteria for the chronic phase of the illness. Um, what you're looking for are signs that Chagas disease has either scarred, uh, scarred the muscle or scarred the conduction system. So sinus node dysfunction, PR prolongation, right bundle branch block. And when this is accompanied by left anterior fasicular block, or even really alone, if somebody's from a Chagas endemic region, it really needs to raise your alarm bells that they have Chagas disease. Heart block can be seen, and this is a very, very arrhythmogenic illness, so PVCs. I know we see lots of PVCs, but these people get a lot of PVCs, and it's a bad prognostic sign. So this is a nice meta-analysis of tens of thousands, I think, of EKGs that were done in studies of patients who had Chagas to compare to non-Chagas patients. And these are the ones that sort of shook out as being significantly associated with Chagas disease. This one's my favorite because it's the first degree AV block. It kind of reminds me of the Ohio State University. I didn't realize that we needed to call it that. Um, but really, the, the main point is just to focus down here on the right bundle, the bivascular block and the right bundle branch block. The only other thing, though, that I want to say is that if your EKG abnormality is not on this chart, that doesn't mean it can't be an indicator of Chagas <coughs> disease. There are a lot of patients who don't have these hallmark lesions whose EKGs are very modestly abnormal who can have significant, significant cardiac problems, including a patient that was seen uh, through Cambridge Health Alliance recently who had both apical and inferior wall aneurysms and had a stroke from the apical aneurysm whose EKG showed only borderline um, uh, low voltage. So just because it isn't on here doesn't mean it can't be an EKG indicator of Chagas disease. 
Um, these are data from two heart failure studies. This is down from here is also from the paradigm and atmosphere um, uh, combined analysis. This is from a heart failure center in Brazil. I'm afraid I don't remember exactly which site it's from. Um, but this compares the EKG findings in Chagas patients. This one is other non-ischemic, uh, uh, other non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. This one here is ischemic, non-ischemics and other, and other, uh, and ischemic. I'm sorry. Um, the point really being that right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block, is much more common in the Chagas patients than it is in the non-Chagas patients. With one, I think, really interesting exception. They didn't look at sarcoid in these studies, but I think it's actually really intriguing how much Chagas disease looks like sarcoid. Um, there's so many ways in which these diseases are similar to the point that I feel like if you're looking at an echo or an EK wondering if your patient has has sarcoid. If they're from Latin America, they probably have Chagas, and, and the reverse is probably true. So left bundle branch block, much less common, but it does occur in Chagas patients. So just because your patient doesn't have bifascicular block or right bundle and they have heart failure does not mean they don't have Chagas disease. The left bundle branch block patients have implications for, uh, for CRT. Um, and then you can see, at least in, in the, the, this larger study down here, that atrial fibrillation is more common um, in the patients with, uh, with Chagas disease. Um, than in the ischemic heart disease patients. So that goes on to, gets into the next test that you might do. If your patient has an abnormal EKG, in general, it's recommended that they get a Holter monitor to look for, if, they, if they're not endorsing symptoms of syncope, for, uh, for signs that they might be at high risk for, arrhythmi uh, for an arrhythmogenic event, particularly looking for non-sustained VT. Um, imaging in Chagas, this is a nice document, uh, but I really put this up here to actually talk about imagers in Chagas because I think right now we diagnose this disease so infrequently that one of the best places, the best seat from which to actually start thinking about it is when you're the cardiac imager and you're looking at an abnormal test and you're seeing something and you're like, that looks like it could be Chagas disease, and the patient's last name suggests that they could be from Latin America. It is a little bit profiling, but it actually had worked pretty well for me in the echo lab, and I, I would encourage people to start thinking about it that way. So the first test that I want to talk about from that perspective is echo in Chagas disease. This is a really nice review from Harry Aquatella, who knows a tremendous amount about Chagas disease and echo. And uh, just on the side here, I want to very briefly say that A, B, C, and D are stages of Chagas cardiomyopathy. In A, patients basically have normal EKGs, and it's thought that that puts them into a very low-risk category. Um, and so people actually look for sort of subclinical um, problems like strain. There's conflicting data about whether or not strain is helpful, and there's no sort of long-term follow-up to say what the implications of strain are. As you move into B and C, you're looking at patients who have stage B is asymptomatic, uh, pro uh, but, but um, abnormalities on EKG. C would be asymptomatic uh, with, with low EF, and D is basically stage 4 heart failure. So these are some of the hallmark lesions that patients with Chagas disease can have. Uh, there's the LV apical aneurysm that I was talking with you about before, and I'll show you an echo example of that. Unfortunately, that does not occur in zero patients who have normal EKGs, which is why I really want everybody to get an echo if they can have one. And that's obviously a resource-dependent uh, phenomenon, but still. And then as the disease progresses across, the, across the, the stages, you see more and more of these apical aneurysms. There's also the LV postero-basal lesion. Um, that uh, you saw that uh, with the scarring in the infralateral wall. Again, you can find that in patients with normal EKGs. It's uncommon. Much more common as the disease progresses. EF goes down, and survival is very closely linked to ejection fraction. So one of the things I do want to say about this apical aneurysm is I, I think about this in many ways to be very similar to the apical hypertrophs who we see in the echo lab, and we're always wondering whether or not we're actually seeing the apex well. And often we aren't, and it's why we give them some sort of contrast media, and I feel pretty strongly that we ought to be doing that with Chagas patients as well. Uh, because I've actually even seen patients who've had bad hearts where I thought I've seen the apex well, and when they've gone to a ventriculogram, I'll see that they actually have an apical aneurysm. And there's some way that this actually really will impact clinical management, I think, so, and I'll get to that in a moment. So this is an example from, um, uh, from DC of a 25-year-old El Salvadorian immigrant who's a construction worker. He presented for medical attention because he was having some palpitations, and he had bifascicular block and PVCs on his EKG, and this was his baseline echo. I don't know what people think about how the apex looks and whether or not they would have called their tech back to do better pictures or not. After he had an MCA stroke, he had this, and I think I can convince you that there is a little saccular aneurysm at the apex. So this, to me, is a pretty good example of why we either need to do a great job of imaging the apex or get some help imaging the apex in these patients. 
So I'm going to leave. Uh, we can talk about nuclear studies afterwards if anybody wants to. We could talk about MRI, though. Um, many studies have shown an association of late gadolinium enhancement with Chagas disease, including, unfortunately, in patients who have normal EKGs, which suggests that EKG may not be the perfect arbiter of who is sick and who is not. It's really hard to know because we haven't gotten long-term studies of what it means to have normal EKG and scar on MRI, but I certainly would worry about that patient. It's just my, my own gut feeling. It's clear that magnitude of scar is associated with, with worse outcomes, and uh, the question is whether or not there's role in risk stratification for defibrillator therapy. And that is like what we, I think, think about in other non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. Um, this is a nice paper, one of two that came out in Jack in 2018, two, two different studies that actually looked at, at the scarring that people had. And just because of time, I think I'm going to go on to an example of an MRI. Uh, this is that same patient, the El Salvadorian uh, immigrant who had the MCA stroke, and this is his MRI here, where you can see the saccular aneurysm very well, and you can see that he's got GAD uptake at his apex. So moving on now very briefly to prognosis of Chagas cardiomyopathy, um, even in contemporary era using the unbelievably excellent guideline-directed medical <coughs> therapy in the paradigm heart failure and atmosphere trials, these patients have worse outcomes than patients who have other cardiomyopathies, 40% higher risk of death. The one study that looked at this in the United States showed that death and transplant occurred in 36% of the patients versus 10% of the non-Chagas patients at 36 months. So it's a disease we have to take pretty seriously. I'm going to move through this. So now that you've evaluated your patient and they have Chagas disease, how are you going to treat them? So the first question that people ask is whether or not there's any role for antiparasitic therapy. The good news on this front is that benzonidazole was approved by the FDA about a year and a half ago. For decades, there was no way to get this medication unless you actually went to the CDC and asked them for it as part of an investigational protocol. The bad news about both of these medications is that they're horrible. They're really toxic. You have maybe 65 to 85 percent of people being able to finish the therapy and with, for benzonidazole and even less for nifurtamox. You have to take them for 60 to 90 days. And unfortunately with benzonidazole, which really keeps me awake at night when I'm treating somebody, is that there's really frequent rash and unfortunately some, very small numbers probably, but some of those patients will get a bolus skin reaction. So my nightmare is to take an undocumented, uninsured immigrant and give them a medication that puts them in the ICU. Um, just saying. Uh, so what's the data? Who should be treated? So there's really, really great evidence that if you treat a newborn with, shot, with, um, with congenital Chagas with, with benzonidazole, that they will seronegativize in a permanent way. That also seems to be true for children or people who are recently infected. Um, there's also really interesting observational data that suggests that if you treat a woman with chi of childbearing age with benzonidazole, that they will dr dramatically decrease th their risk of, of, of maternal fetal transmission. So that seems pretty good. Unfortunately, there is only prospective trial study that was not actually really all that well done that shows that, that benzonidazole therapy uh, has any impact on the development of cardiac disease in adults. And in general, nifurtamox is felt to be as effective. So there are some, in quotes, guidelines. They're not really got, it, it, it's, it, it was a, a paper that was drafted by a group of evidence, I think, of, of experts, including Jamie McGuire, about who to treat. Um, and in general, it reinforces the data that we just talked about, children, women of childbearing age. There's a very vague recommendation about treating, offering treatment to anybody up to the age of 50, uh, maybe questionably between 50 and 60. And then the big question that we have here in the cardiology clinic is, does it help if somebody already has Chagas cardiomyopathy? And this is a, a question for which there is randomized trial evidence. There are uh, 2,854 patients were randomized to benzonidazole versus placebo in a multi-country trial. The amazing thing was 99.5% follow-up at five years, including, I think, a Colombian cardiologist having to get on his motorbike to go out into rural vis uh, villages to be able to provide the follow-up, and actually 75% seven-year follow-up, so it's pretty fantastic. Um, overall, there was no cardi hard cardiac endpoint benefit with benzonidazole therapy in spite of the fact that there was very significant reduction in PCR positivity in the patients who were treated. So there are a huge number of caveats. We could get into a big argument about it. But uh, in general, this question feels like it's asked and answered for many of the patients who already have established cardiac disease. Uh, in terms of any additional management of Chagas heart disease, what are you going to do if you can't treat them with antiparasitic ag um, agents? These are two really nice reviews, very recent. This, I think, was 2017 in Jack. This one was last year in Cirque. 
uh, just as references for later. Basically, it's guideline-directed medical therapy, although we have to acknowledge that not a lot of studies were actually done specifying Chagas disease patients. In fact, they were very few, and they tended to have very small numbers. So it's really difficult to know for sure that anything that we're offering these patients actually is really effective specifically in Chagas cardiomyopathy. There are some guidelines from Brazil and Argentina about using ACE inhibitors. There were Chagas patients, as we discussed in the, in the, the, um, the, the paradigm heart failure uh, study. Parachute is actually a, a trial that's, that just started now or is just starting looking at um, Entresto in Chagas patients only. So we'll have very specific data from that, from, from this new study. Um, aldosterone antagonists recommended beta blockers. There was some concern that beta blockers might be pro-arrhythmic in a bradyarrhythmic sense. They seem to be well tolerated. Uh, and then amiodarone is kind of interesting. A lot of people end up on amiodarone because they can't afford defibrillators and they have a tremendous amount of ventricular arrhythmia. Um, and there's conflicting data about whether or not it's good or it's bad. And so people are at, there are actually two randomized trials. One, I think it just ended, Chagossix, which has randomized people to amio versus defibrillator. And it's a, a primary prevention study. And CHARM is just looking, to, looking at amio alone to see if there's any benefit. So, um, I, oops, sorry. This um, came from, uh, again, Dr. Solomon's paper here looking at um, about the, the, the extent to which the Chagas patients were treated the same as the other patients. And there are some really interesting things which I, I think may play some of a role in terms of the worse outcomes, which is that Chagas patients got beta blockers less frequently. Part of that may have been that they got amiodarone way more frequently. So it may be that they were unable to get on appropriate beta blockade because they were taking amiodarone. I don't know. Uh, also, what's really sad and just sort of a state of working in a resource-limited environment with this patient population is that these Chagas patients, who honestly I have to imagine many more than 7% had an indication for a defibrillator, only 7% of them got defibrillators. So in terms of other therapies, we have electrophysiology. Um, there's uh, high rates of sinus node dysfunction and atrial fibrillation. Defibrillators, they're actually class, not on the basis of any great evidence, but class 2A indication for the Euro, for Europace at an EF of less than 40%. I think that's also true in Brazil, at least I was told that recently. And patients with defibrillators tend to get more appropriate shocks than patients with uh, defibrillators with, for other etiologies. Um, there's not a lot of great data about resynchronization, and it's a little bit conflictual. And then the one last thing that's kind of interesting about Chagas disease uh, and EP is that um, the pa patients will benefit from VT ablations, and it's actually the disease entity for which epicardial VT ablations were, was designed. Um, I don't really know what it is about the parasite that makes it so that it, it requires that degree of, of aggressiveness, because um, it, it is re-entry. It's, it's the, the same as any other scar. But for whatever reason, it tends to have more epicardial circuits, is my understanding. The reason I put this echo up is because, I, I don't know about you, I don't think this EF is too bad. You know, it, it's probably pretty close to 50%. This is an El Salvadorian immigrant, undocumented unfortunately, who was working at a fast food restaurant and experienced a sudden death event and was resuscitated by a policeman who was waiting in line for his french fries. Um, his first echo was horrible, it looked like he had an EF of 20, but this is probably actually about a week later. He has a defibrillator, but he is undocumented, so he no longer has any ability to get his defibrillator checked. So that is the, my world of Chagas disease in Washington. Um, anticoagulation, this is another issue. And actually, what I wanted to, the point that I really wanted to make about this one is that this is a patient who had a life altering event with an ejection fraction that really wasn't that bad. So I worry a lot about these Chagas patients, particularly ones who might have focal scar in the infralateral wall, because we know that's so arrhythmogenic. What to do about them is not so clear whether or not we should be haltering them, whether or not we should be getting MRIs to look at scar burden doing EP studies, I don't think anybody has the answer, but these are patients who are gonna have sudden death events, can have sudden death events at EFs that we don't usually worry about. By the same token, there are also patients who will have strokes at EFs that we don't usually worry about. This is a patient whose echo is much worse than the one that I showed you earlier. She has cardiomyopathy, obviously. She came into the hospital with a stroke, and this was found on her echo, and then subsequently somebody asked, you know, asked me if we should test her for Chagas. Of course we did, and she had it. So um, who to offer primary prevention? Another really great question that is not actually well answered in the literature. There is a scoring system that people, they, there was a, a database of about 1,000 patients, I think, or maybe a little bit over, 
um, that people tried to come up with something like a CHADS score, and it's called the IPEC point score. Um, you get two points for LV dysfunction, one for age greater than 48, one for apical aneurysm, and one for repolarization abnormalities. So this patient, I mean, let's say she didn't actually have the thrombus, we, she'd probably be somebody that you would think about giving anticoagulation to. The young man who we saw with the very bad MCA stroke with just the apical aneurysm, he wouldn't have met criteria. So it's got to be, you know, it's medicine's an art rather than a science. It's hard to know what to do with, with, those, with those patients. Uh, but it is why I feel like searching carefully for the apical aneurysm is really important because it does seem to me that it has some implications about whom you might offer anticoagulation therapy to. Heart transplantation, definitely an option. We've had three transplants since I started working on Chagas down in Washington, and there have been three across the river in Fairfax. All the patients have done very well. They have, however, all reactivated after a transplant, and that happens from the CDC has followed many of the patients who've been transplanted in the country, and their data shows that there's about a 60% reactivation rate. So you have to monitor people for reactivation. The good news is that we do it usually by using PCR, and so when we catch somebody who seems to be reactivating, we catch them before they have clinical disease. Some people might argue that's not really reactivation, but that's that's our protocol here in the, in the U.S. has low mortality. It responds very well to benzonidazole. Some patients will reactivate again. Usually after a couple of years, they stop reactivating. So that's the bad news about heart transplant. The good news is there seems to be better survival, and some of that may actually be because these patients are younger and have less comorbid disease. So a lot of people say to me, well, I've never seen a case. I say, well, I think you need to rethink that. So 17.6% of U.S. citizens are Hispanic, according to the census, and 34% of them are foreign-born. That's a lot of people. Using country of origin data and using the estimated prevalence in the countries of origin, the CDC, and actually Jen has data that uh, has a, a paper about this that has even more updated figures, but I think it's still, we're going to say, yeah. 300,000 because it's the easiest. 300,000 cases of Chagas disease in the United States with an estimated than 40 to 50,000 cardiac cases in the U.S. There's the first data on the map, really, with the exception of a small study in Washington, D.C., came out of the Olive View Medical Center. I have to give a shout out to Dr. Sheba Mimandi, who really has done a phenomenal job of raising awareness. She started looking in her heart failure population at the Olive View Medical Center. These are patients from Latin American countries who had non ischemic cardiomyopathies and found that 18.5% of her patients had Chagas as the cause of their cardiomyopathy. She then looked at her abnormal EKGs in at-risk patients. These were patients with bundle branch blocks, found that 5% of her bundle branch blocks patients had Chagas. 18% of them, if they had bifascicular block, had Chagas disease. And 7.5% of her patients who had pacemakers, and this is not defibrillators, pacemakers had Chagas. She then went on to screen close to 5,000 people in a community-based screening program and found that about 1% of them had Chagas disease, but a considerably higher rate if they were from El Salvador and also certain regions in Mexico. So we'll take it to Boston now. I mean, you all are very familiar with this, I'm sure. There are 850,000 people who say that they're Latino uh, in Massachusetts for 2015 ACS data, 134,000 in Boston. You know, you get, it's hard to, to figure out where you want to pick to look, but lots of people from Latin America. The predominant country of origin is Puerto Rico and, and the DR, and neither of those countries are places where Chagas disease is found. But there's a very large, um, a very large Chagas population, I mean, a large El Salvadorian population in East Boston, which is where they have been doing their research. And then we all know that there's a very large Brazilian community here uh, in, in the area. And these are just some nice maps showing uh, some of that. This is Jen and Julia's slide. This is from the study that they did over at the East Boston uh, Health Center. They actually have now screened, I, did you say 6,000? Close to 6,000 people, but for the purposes of this, of this, um, of this poster, 5,217 people. Some interesting things on this is that 207 were positive by their initial screening assay. At the end of the day, though, only 50 of those confirmed positive. So it's 24%, which really reiterates the fact that you do not give a patient a diagnosis of Chagas disease without confirmation. Um, their overall prevalence was 1%, so certainly lots of Chagas disease here in Boston. And this, for me is the story of my life. This is the cascade of care for Chagas disease in East Boston. So you can see you start off with 100% of the patients engaged. When you move to being referred to care, you drop to 94% of them. When you refer to being evaluated to care, you drop to 74% of them. Treatment initiated, 38% of them. Treatment completed, 20% of them. This is what it's like to work with this population. And it's, just, it's uh, heartbreaking, actually, to feel like we are uh, ineffective at being able to keep this population in care. Um, so 
what would I like for you to do now after this talk? I'd like for you to screen for Chagas disease. There are clinical scenarios that we talked about where I think you should think about it, EKG abnormalities and arrhythmias that might suggest the disease, abnormal echo or MRI findings, and patients with cardiomyopathies. Are there risk factors for seropositivity too? If you're thinking, if you're in your primary care clinic, thinking about it, patients who lived in rural housing in an endemic region, people who can recall exposure to the bug or having been bitten, knowing what the bug is actually is really important. And if you know about the illness or if your mother was infected, that would certainly be a reason to screen. Um, I can refer you, I, I already showed you the, the, the title page from this article, but this is, I think, a really nice sort of algorithm for how to deal with Chagas that came out of that article in Jack in 2017. Thank you so much for listening to this. I actually want to thank you for bringing this to our attention and for all the hard work you're doing for so many people. Uh, it, it is an interface of uh, healthcare delivery and the problem. The problem itself is daunting in healthcare delivery. Uh, I wanted to ask some people here. So first of all, Jen, this was your poster. Who's Jen? Oh yeah, I'm one of the ID fellows here at the Brigham. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, thanks for your hard work. Oh. Uh, and what about the Brigham? So tell us about our experience here. And take the mic and. I actually, so to be honest, I think most of the Brigham's, um, most of the Brigham Chagas care is best. I, I've been here just for a year as a, an ID fellow or a year and change now. Um, obviously, Jamie McGuire is a world expert in Chagas disease. So I, I don't get as many consults here. I get more questions at MGH, frankly, where Jamie's not present. Um, I'm not really sure. I know there's, we actively think about this in the setting of, of anybody who's an LVAD or heart transplant. And um, that's the place we think about it most. We don't have um, most of the patients that Rachel refers to that fall out of care in this Strong Hearts project in East Boston are referred to Boston Medical Center due to their mass health kind of allowance. So that those patients are not cared for here at the Brigham. Um, I know James treated some people, not I don't think in the last year or so we've gotten that many um, from the new Brigham system, but um, certainly he and if not I are happy to always talk through scenarios where you might think about this. Well, I was going to ask Rachel to uh, bring the Jamie McGuire story back in. So Jamie's been here uh, more than 40-something years. And I know he did the work when I first met him. So when did he actually do his work? And it continues to go on. And is that what stimulated you, or did you just independently have this bug? <laughs> I think that some, at least some of Jamie's publications come from the 1980s uh, when he was working in Brazil, I think as part of his doctoral work, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, I thought that I was going start to start my medical career in tropical medicine and sort of ended up taking a very, very um, serpiginous route to where I am today. Ended up going through cardiology to get here. So That's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but Jamie is an inspiration and he's taught me so much and he's always willing to talk about Jagas disease. So Well actually for those of you who don't know him, he's willing to help you with everything in infectious disease, but certainly. Thank you very much. David Rachel, thank you for a great talk. It was just terrific. Um, there's so many things I want to ask you, and, but I wanted to just highlight the issue of stroke um, for a minute. Um, it's something that obviously is a big concern, and I totally agree with you that the, um, the sort of risk evaluation scoring systems are inadequate. Um, is there any data on brain scanning patients with Chagas disease who have no neurological signs? Because as we know from the atrial fibrillation literature, you know, there's a lot of little holes in the brain that we can find in patients that uh, have been cardioverted or patients that have had ablation to atrial fibrillation and have no neurological symptoms. Um, what's the data on the asymptomatic, from a neurological point of view, patient which has it? Well, the, the I just actually was looking at a study about this the other day, although I can't remember if everybody was asymptomatic. So if you will beg my forgiveness, I will find that study and then send it to you um, so we can see. But I, there, it's, it is clear that there are people who are having events uh, of which people are not aware, absolutely. 
Much in the same way I think that that's true if you look in AFib and, yeah. and other things that's that... That's the talk he gave here about a couple of months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I have a patient, I have a patient who received his pacemaker at the age of 12. I saw him two years ago, he's 25 now. Wow. And he's still getting pacemaker injections. Mm -hmm. And he's got a normal ventricle, he doesn't have any of the sort of risk factors that you mentioned. And this was obviously not a predictable, yeah. but it's a source of significant disability, obviously. And um, it's very troublesome that that's the tip of the iceberg. I think it's probably not happening, but we're just not going to be yeah. aware of. No, that's a, it's a great idea for an investigation if it hasn't been done. No. So I was going to ask Neil or Eldrin about our heart failure, advanced heart failure services. It doesn't have to be advanced heart failure. It could be just asymptomatic people. But what's our experience? Well, that's a great talk. Thank you. And, um, Let's we, pass we, the mic so that... Uh, so we, you know, we've also uh, had a little bit of experience transplanting patients with Chagas, and what I know your, your um, comments about how they generally do well, um, but you need a screen for reactivation. Um, I guess my question relates to the one large clinical trial and the challenge of picking an outcome for these patients. It was done in a largely resource-poor setting, and so things like serial echoes um, weren't going to be an option. So. If, if someone gave you $50 million and said do another clinical trial, um, what would you look at? Are there any immediate phenotypes or markers of disease progression that we could use um, that may make us feel more confident about treating people with earlier stages of cardiomyopathy related to shocks? Yeah, so it's a great question. What I would say is there actually is an echo sub-study that had, I'm pretty sure, at least at least 1,000 patients in it. I don't know if you remember, but there, there certainly is a large group of people that actually had echo follow-up. Um, but I, so I think one of the things that people are aggressively looking at are whether or not there are any biomarkers uh, for disease, and that's a very active area in research. Um, so people, they've tried to pull Jim Genuzzi into it. So um, yeah, so so biomarkers, uh, and I think that uh, you know BNP troponins, and then some uh, MMPs and, and things like that. Eldrin has the microphone. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. And Rachel, I just echo what everyone else has said. This is a great uh, grand rounds. Uh, the question that I have is, uh, when you think of viral myocarditis and you look at uh, kind of cardiotropic viruses, oftentimes you get a global, um, albeit acute, uh, kind of hypokinesis. It seems like uh, consistently you see these apical aneurysms and you see inferior posterior uh, kind of, uh, or posterior lateral kind of uh, regional wall motion abnormalities. Is there any understanding as to why with this particular parasite you get the apical aneurysm and just the location of the hypokinesis. Yeah, I mean, I have searched the literature for that. If there's any a Brazilian cardiologist here who would like to weigh in, I, I can't find a good explanation for it. Some of the pathophysiology is thought to be due to watershed ischemia, uh, so that might make sense for apical lesions, um, but I, I think it's unknown, much in the way I think also we don't really know, say, why sarcoid would cause a basal septal aneurysm or, or even aneurysms elsewhere. So that, that, that I think that's on the unknown list, if, if you would agree. Please, if I'm well, saying something all wrong, please tell me. my Brazilian cardiologist kind of hid when you, that was asked. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to answer that unanswerable question, but uh, let's have a comment. Luis? So, for the fantastic talk, thank you very much. Uh, fortunately, I come from a state in Brazil that we don't have endemic chagas, and we never had, even in the very south part of Brazil. Uh, but what was trouble is what you showed us, all, all the guideline-based therapy for heart failure is being uh, provided for the Brazilian patients, but most of these trials do not include Chagas patients, uh, uh, very few of them. And the other thing is, uh, this right bundle branch block is the main EPG finding. Uh, uh, risk randomization therapy is something that we feel uh, sometimes is not the best approach for these patients. So, uh, um, but uh, about the ethical uh, changes, uh, I mean, I think it's really an unknown why, why they are. So I'm currently doing a trial post-MI, and there are a lot of patients coming from Brazil. Uh, and I've done MI trials. Uh, uh, so should we suspect that some people from Brazil or other Latin American countries Oh, by the way, happen to have a heart attack and also have Chagas? So Can't you have m multiple diseases? Fantastic question, absolutely. Particularly as 
what we're seeing now, at least in the states, is mostly going to be people with more chronic disease. And even in the countries where they come from, there's a lot of comorbidity. So these patients have diabetes, they have hypertension. I have a patient who has multivessel coronary disease who also happens to have Chagas disease. I have no idea what's yeah. caused his scar. Um, I, you know, sometimes you see there's some coronary disease, but it's out of proportion to the disease in the ventricle, and then you're thinking it's probably a different process. But without question, that's going to be something that we face as this population ages, for sure. Yes. Uh, poster, you were also on the poster? Yeah, Julia Kohler. Yeah, okay. she's um, So, uh, I, my name is Julia We're Kohler. going to get a mic to you in a second, Julia. Thank you. We're a little slow here. The ID group, I know the mic goes faster. <laughs> yes, we and ID talk fast. <laughs> so, I'm an ID staff at Children, and I wanted to comment on two points. <laughs> Firstly, here in Massachusetts, unlike uh, the DC area, uh, we do have the Mass Health Safety Net for uh, anyone dependent upon income and not upon immigration status. Uh, the safety net is not so. Mass Health, which is our version of Medicaid, uh, is you know the safety net is a limited insurance, but uh, it does cover a lot more than having zero. That's point number one. Point number two is that um, here in Boston, we're actually developing another uh, cardiology center of excellence for Chagas disease at Boston Medical Center. And wouldn't it be uh, fantastic if your department um, became part of that? So the great expertise that you collectively have in this room, wouldn't it be amazing if that could be brought to bear? Because um, development, for example, of guidelines, you know, at which point should um, uh, anticoagulation be implemented, at which point antiarrhythmic therapy and all of that, uh, that would be, you know, your your intellectual power might contribute to that. And thirdly, in order for you to do that, you need your primary care colleagues to screen. And fourthly, the reason that treatment is even being debated as to should patients with an already diagnosed cardiomyopathy be treated, etc which is what Rachel was describing with this trial uh, where no benefit was shown because they already had cardiomyopathy. Once we get better medications, which are in the pipeline, which are less toxic, that whole debate is likely to fall by the wayside. I, you know, an infectious disease, if you have a strep throat, of course you're going to give them oxacillin, even though the rheumatic fever that you're trying to prevent is extremely rare. So I'm just saying Rachel might be inspiring you to um, focus on this issue where you can have a true tremendous impact both on patient care right here but also potentially nationally and worldwide. Do you mind if I respond? Yeah, oh, sure. So thanks for saying that. I, I think actually, as we think in the Chavez community, the small number of us, um, about where to target our screening efforts, um, there are some people who will argue, well, we need to find women of childbearing age because we can reduce maternal fetal transmission, which is absolutely correct. But the problem is that um, I think it takes a while to find your first patient. And so when people start and they don't find somebody right away, they think we're not going to find it. If you start looking in your cardiology clinics, you will find it much more quickly. And then every doctor who cares for that patient will see what the ravages of Chagas can do. And then they'll be more incented to think about it in the future because they'll understand how devastating this disease can be. Which is why, you know, with my sort of zealot evangelist hat, I would encourage people to screen in cardiology, even if we can't, we don't have a specific therapy for Chagas disease that will cure the illness at that point. That's, that's not the main reason. But so. is there any uh, maternal screening statewide? <laughs> 
There's no maternal screening statewide. Boston Medical Center has started screening their pregnant women from endemic countries a few months ago. The East Boston Neighborhood Health Center does screen uh, their pregnant women. Um, those are the only, the, uh, the state health department whom we approached about it uh, declined to do that. And in fact, uh, Shock's disease used to be a reportable disease in uh, Massachusetts, but that was abolished in 2014. So the state lab does get uh, pre, you know, um, sorry, uh, um, screening from every newborn, newborn screening, uh, but uh, Shock's disease is not part of that. Yes, uh, Michael Giverts. Uh that was great. I, I actually, um, actually, I was. Remembering. See, Michael Giverts doesn't need a mic. He just. <laughs> no, Mark. When I was when I was a first year fellow and I had to do a Bornstein conference, yeah. I did a case on Chagas. I remember it. I remember yeah, it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sam and Sam Voltaire was my attending, and he insisted on looking at my. Well, they weren't slides then; they were these overheads, and he insisted on reviewing them before I was able to show them. So Still they does. Were, they were they were good. Um, <laughs> as I recall, and I never forgot the page because we went on a train and then we follow them for many years. But I have a very practical question because we do see these patients, as you say, they come from all over the world, but we see a lot of patients from Central and South America. Is there a really easy resource we can have where you can plug in the town or city that the patient is from so you can find out if it is actually a highly endemic area without having to Google the name of a, a, a province or an endemic match out with the CDC data? So I think that's a fantastic question. And it's actually, I haven't talked with you yet about it, but we're, some of us in our small Shires community are thinking about trying to develop an app that would allow people to do that with ease. The huge problem is that there are some countries that have reasonable countrywide data. And there are some countries where if you look at the map, for instance, <coughs> Colombia, that you can only map out half of the country and then the rest of it's just basically white where color indicates that there's disease because they don't have the data from there. So in general, I would say, particularly at the cardi heart failure cardiologist <coughs> level, if they're, la if they're from a non-island Latin American country, just order the test. If it comes back positive, it's false positive, you'll get the confirmation. It's, you know, compared to, every, compared to their LVAD, it's pretty cheap. So I think you're really okay doing that. And it's just, otherwise, it's, it's actually putting weight, until we come up with good enough data to try and get an app that actually will be helpful to people, it's, it's too much to ask for you to try to, to sort through it. Yeah, but it. your app could say, just do the test. Ah, that's good. A one-page app. No, <laughs> Even I could design that app. If, if, you, if you have this question, do the test. Yeah, it's great. I like that. <laughs> All right, well, let me uh, not only thank you, but thank Umberto. This was very stimulating. Oh.